if the Pennines are the backbone of Britain, the backbone of the Pennines is certainly that large lump of limestone centred on Whernside that runs from the Yorkshire Dales to the Scottish border. It's a hard rock, but it can be dissolved by rainwater, and over millions of years it has been, which is why, in a curious way, some local hillside farms have, alongside them, huts which are filled with young people who spend every weekend exploring the potholes and passages, the rushing underground streams and the great silent caverns that honeycomb this entire area. That is, once they've slept off the effects of Saturday night. Mm. Mm. Come on, wake up, chap, you lazy finisher. <sighs> Go on, Jack. Oh. It's about nine o'clock. Yeah. Well, that looks good, Les. Anyone make you a drink yet? Not yet, yeah, The cavers don't make the mistake of neglecting the inner man before they tackle Simpson Pot, a complicated cave system in the hillside across the valley. Wetsuits are probably the best caving attire. Simpson, being an active pot, means that there's a lot of water going through it. The rubber suits help to keep you warm, though these don't do it all that well, as they've seen a lot of hardware and they're tattered and torn. But once the cavers are dressed in them, they're ready to plunge themselves in icy water, to crawl through mud, to squeeze through impossible spaces, and generally to enjoy several hours of fairly excruciating fun. No wonder the commonest comment of all about caving is, what a way to spend a Sunday. There's nothing very special about our five cavers. They're all northerners, they're all in their twenties or early thirties, and they've all got full-time weekday jobs. John Russell is from Leeds. He's a mechanical engineer, he's 28, and he's something of a cave rescue explosives expert. Jack Pickup comes from nearby Ingleton. He's a draftsman, married with two children, and is a cave rescue organization controller. John Shepherd is from Liverpool, where he's a trainee solicitor. Shep's had one or two narrow escapes from drowning while caving. Dave Cobley is a 32-year-old building lecturer from Huddersfield. He's a climber as well as a caver. And the last member of the team is Leslie Albiston. She's a PE instructor from Accrington College of Further Education. It's a long walk from the hut to the cave entrance, and on the way, you cross a dry valley where a river once ran before it disappeared underground into the sort of cave system the five are going to explore today. It's not only a long walk to the cave entrance, it's a long climb, about 400 feet up the steep hillside with the hut and the valley far below. It's inside that hill that John Russell and the rest are going to spend the day. If you ask them why they do it, you get the usual answers. To find out something about your own nature, to get away from the world above, or to scare yourself so much you're only too glad to get back to the world above. There are as many answers as there are potholers. At the top of the hill, the start of the exploration isn't too bad and should take about 15 minutes to cover, if all goes well, that is. The distance from the entrance to the five steps, the last obstacle in this section, is about 50 yards. And this is where it all starts, a not very impressive hole in the hillside. Simpson Pot, named after the man who discovered the entrance just before the First World War, and then forgot about it for more than 30 years, when a new generation of cavers set about exploring it, taking their first steps into the unknown darkness. When you first go in and you switch your light on, you can't see a thing. It seems just like a red glow on your helmet. You keep tripping over rocks and all sorts of things that are on the floor, especially after going out, out of brilliant sunlight. What's that, but once the caver's eyes get used to the darkness, he can make out a narrow tunnel leading northeast from the entrance and keeping just below the surface of the moor for the first 30 yards or so. It 
but it takes time for your eyes and yourself to accommodate to an environment that Leslie Alderston always feels is hostile. I always find that I fall into every pool of water that is to be found. I seem to be bottomless, usually tripping over in the process. Also, the rocks seem to jump up and grab you. Everything gets in the way. Your feet are in the wrong place, your hands in the wrong place, all the holes are in the wrong place. And now comes the first real obstacle. This is the last time the cavers will be dry on this trip. From now on, they'll be cold and wet every inch of the way. <laughs> Leslie doesn't like the cold and wet, and she doesn't like the dark, but she suffers it and even appears to enjoy it, just as they all do. It's hard for a non-caver to understand why, though, when you hear John Russell describing what it feels like. It, it's bloody cold when you go in water for the first time in a wetsuit. All the little tears that the cave grinds into the rubber leak. And the water shoots in in some very nasty places. And just in case they aren't thoroughly wet already, at five steps, another stream joins the system. Arriving at step spot, you're immediately aware of the water crashing down the pitches. And um, though these short pitches don't need ladder or lifeline. They should certainly be treated with caution. Uh, on one's return, should the water have risen, they could certainly prove a serious obstacle. When descending caves, the easy part is going down, and the really difficult part is when you're returning. But they're not coming up, they're going down with a vengeance, for at five steps they really begin to plunge deep into the hillside. Twenty minutes in, and the second section beginning. And now the route hairpins back almost due south towards the pit and the ominously named Storm Pot. But first, the pit has got to be crossed somehow. Next you approach the pit. Be a fool to say that uh, you really aren't aware of its, uh, its awkwardness and the fact that one false move and you're down. Probably the thing that makes it worse, of course, is the fact that uh, it's constricted immediately across the top of the hole and, and you're really forced to look down into the crashing spray below. If you slip while making the crossing of the pit, there's a fall of 20 feet, then you bounce once and fall another 60 feet to the bottom of the storm pot just as the water does. But at least once you're across, it's dry. For now, you're following the way the water used to go before it took its present path. How many thousands of years ago that happened, nobody knows, of course, but John Russell is grateful it did. For now, they bypass the pit in moderate comfort, although there are several vertical drops or pitches that need ladders, and it can still be a bit of a struggle. You think they've got the pitch ladders? Once you're underground, odd things can happen to your sense of direction, as John Shepard has found out on many occasions. The intriguing thing about being underground is you lose all sense of direction. It's quite surprising because in the space of 100 feet or so, you, 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 may, you may turn around in a complete circle, in fact, in two circles. At the bottom of the pit bypass, the route rejoins the water at Storm Pot. Ladders are needed to get down the next 30-foot pitch, so Dave Cobley belays one firmly before the descent through the spray, the noise and the wind begins. By the time you get to the bottom, you're cold, wet and out of breath, but at least the ladder feels as though it's for you, not against you. Ladders like this are only about one-fifth the weight of the old-fashioned rope ones and are much less bulky, which makes them far better for caving. Okay. 
Once safely at the bottom, he signals for more gear to be passed down, ready for the next stage in the attack on the Simpson Pot complex. After that, it's the turn of the remaining members of the party to make the descent. Leslie's turn is last. She's being lifeline from the bottom of the descent, with the rope passing through a sort of pulley fixed up top. The cable at the bottom acts as an anchor to the cable coming down the ladder. So, safeguarded in this way, Leslie makes her way to the bottom of Storm Pot, but doesn't much like it when she gets there. The worst part of caving is the cold. I dread the thought of a long stop below a pitch, waiting for people, getting colder and colder. Somehow this seems to get inside and you start shivering. It really just goes through you. And it doesn't help, as you stand there shivering, to look at the foam-covered water in Storm Pot lashing about in the wind and the spray. An hour gone now and 140 feet below the surface. The next stage will take us 100 feet deeper in 45 minutes, if we're lucky. But first, the cavers have got to get through the blasted hole. Originally, there was no exit, at least not for anything thicker than water, but with the aid of a little jelly igniter, a way was made. It was christened Blasted Hole, and it's still called that today, maybe for other reasons, since the only way out is to immerse yourself in the icy water and hope you come out at the other side. I think every caver has a certain aspect in potholing which frightens him most, whether it be climbing or, or tight passages or whatever. I personally can't stand water. I get very terrified of water, especially if there's only a limited airspace. I often wonder what it must have been like for the first chap to actually have dived through this particular part. He must have been very courageous and had a great deal of compulsion to, to, to drive him to do this. After which, it's Leslie Alberston's turn. She's got the encouragement of knowing that in this section of the trip, there are some of the formations which are her special caving interest. However, most interests wane with time, and Jack Pickup often wonders just when he'll pack caving in. As a married caver with a wife and two children, at times I think, you know, I, I ought to draw the line and pack it in, and I'm sure I will someday. Uh, but whilst I'm physically capable, there's still this urge to explore caves and potholes and, and, and dig for new finds. I think probably more the older you get, certainly is this urge to sort of get something exciting and new out of life. There's not much technically difficult rock climbing in caving, but what there is can be tricky, as the rocks are almost always wet and very smooth, with few of the positive hand and foot holes of rocks in the open air, and it makes ladders absolutely essential for cavers. There's something friendly about a ladder. For instance, if you've got a carbide light and the water should put it out, you know the ladder's there and you can feel it, and it, it sometimes gives you a certain amount of confidence. Also, when it swings about, it, play, it plays a nice tune, something like Chinese lights, the glass lights which blow in the wind. Well, perhaps you've got to be a caver born and bred to find a consolation like that in conditions like these. But there's always the pleasure of trying to get your acetylene helmet lamp to light again. Slurp up some water from around your feet and blow it into the lamp. That activates the carbide, which gives off gas. If there isn't any water, you can always spit on it. And there are other body fluids that have been used in really dry caves. Then light the lamp and put it back in your hat and you're all set to see the sights. This is the part of Simpson Pot that Leslie likes. For her, one of the chief attractions of caving is examining formations like these. She sees them as earth sculpture that you can move through. After nearly two hours, we've got to the most difficult bit, slit pot, 230 feet below the surface.
slit part is like a vertical letterbox and about as easy to get through. You wriggle and squeeze and push, and all at once you've exploded through it. The trouble is, there's a 90-foot drop on the other side, so if you go through too fast, you'll also go through too far. So, of course, you've got to take safety precautions. You've got to make sure you don't go plunging down on the other side, but you've equally got to make sure that you can descend the other side at your own speed, strictly under control. The method Shep and the team are going to use is a new one in caving, although a well-known one in climbing. It's abseiling. You belay the rope to a convenient bit of a rock or boulder because that's what's going to take your weight as you're going down, and because it is, you make sure it will. Then, when you thread the rope through the abseiler in the approved manner, you're in a position to generate enough friction on the rope as you lower yourself down to be able to regulate the speed of your descent at any moment. But of course, first you've still got to get through slip pot, or had you forgotten? Slip pot is not technically difficult to start, but certainly for some of our bigger members of this trip, it, uh, it's really tight and awkward. And you must remember uh, that it's a bit rather like a cork out of a bottle. It's a good hard thrutch, and then you're suddenly away and find yourself falling unless you really control that last vital push uh, as you splash through into the water. Into the water? Yes because you descend slit pot down a waterfall. But because it's dark and because of the noise of the water and the effect of the spray, it's essential to keep in touch with your mate as he's on his way down. Now it's the turn of the next one to struggle through the slip and start the dark descent. I'm sorry, it seems very difficult to get started on the row. When you're going over the edge, you must always lean backwards so you can walk down the first stretch of wall. This means that somehow you're always thinking if the rope's going to part, it's going to part now you're going to plumb it off backwards into the void. You seem very sort of reliant on this one thin piece of nylon cord which is attaching you to safety. And if anything at all happens to it, you're going to finish up on the rocks far below. There seems to be a sort of gloomy relish in the words John Russell used then. It's hard to escape the feeling that he's actually enjoying the darkness, the damp and the danger, if only because it'll be so pleasant when it stops. Now all five have arrived at the bottom of Slip Pot, 310 feet below where they started two hours ago. At this point, another stream comes swirling in from the nearby Swinstow Pot. The combined waters begin their journey towards what was once considered the final chamber, the point from which you could go no further. Later, when they get there, they'll find a large cavern. And in the days when the only thing to do was climb all the way back up to the surface, it was the place for a rest and a meal. But first, the waterfall down into the final chamber has got to be negotiated. And it isn't the easiest of obstacles after the long, tiring descent down from the surface. The force of the water is considerable, and threatens all the time to sweep the caver away, quite apart from the little local difficulty there is in breathing in the middle of such a body of water. Climbing in a spray, it's sometimes quite difficult to breathe. You took your chin into your chest and try and slurp the, the air out of the water. And if it gets in the back of your throat, it makes you cough and you get all crossed up with your breathing sometimes. Caving is an activity that uses up a tremendous amount of energy. That energy has got to be replaced, so the food has got to have a high energy content.
After a meal, asleep. Dave Cobley is an expert in the art of instantaneous relaxation, but not even an expert is proof against people whose high spirits have come singing back as their blood sugar increases. <laughs> From the final chamber, 380 feet below the entrance, the nearest open air is to the right on the diagram, that is roughly south. But cavers can't follow straight lines because caves don't, and at first the route goes the opposite way. It isn't exactly easy. It's 800 feet long, about 10 inches high, and very wet. When floodwaters are about, it's almost impossible to go back once you've started, as your body corks the tighter parts and the weight of water builds up behind you. It's called Philosopher's Crawl, presumably because it requires a very philosophical approach. John Shepherd was soon in trouble when the floor collapsed. Dangerous boulders everywhere and no hope of progress until a diversion had been made. The headroom is still very low and there's a long way to go in difficult conditions. Leslie Alviston makes her cautious way along, cold, wet and cramped. as the crawl is, it's typical of the fascination of caving, in that the way out of the big so-called final chamber should be such a tiny hole, and that, at its very welcome end, it should suddenly break out into another even bigger cave, the master cave. And breaking into a master cave is a caver's dream, because it's the key to the whole system, the cave into which all the streams of the area flow. Most master caves are below the water table, and so they're inaccessible. This one is the exception and it brings back memories to John Shepherd. The Master Cave brings back very happy memories to me of past friends who were involved in the other explorations but were unfortunately caught out in a flood and drowned in Mustill Caverns. I think this has, personally has made me a lot more cautious caver as regards water and outside weather conditions. One's got to be very wary and very conscious of what's going on on the surface, although you, you can't see it after several hours underground. You haven't a clue whether it's raining or whether the sun's shining. So this is a factor you've got to be uh, deeply in mind. At the point where Philosopher's Crawl enters it, the Master Cave goes away in both directions. Upstream, it leads to yet another pot, Routen, and can quickly fill in flood conditions. The speed of its flow here gives some idea of just how easily a caver could be swept away if there was a downpour up on top of the moor. Downstream, the master cave increases in height quite suddenly, and as the floor drops away quite rapidly, all the water rushing in from the various sources that feed this cave drains into one deep sump. The sump isn't a very attractive sight. The rushing water has left foam traces even on the roof, and the sun floating placidly on the surface, giving little indication of the dangerous undercurrents and steeply sloping floor beneath. Diver after diver has tried to find out where the water goes, how does it get away, what happens down there in that cold water. But no one has solved the mystery, and at least one diver lost his life there. He went in to investigate, and he's never been seen since. John Russell had one more look at the problem, holding onto a line for safety's sake, of course. But within a few seconds, he was in real trouble. He wanted out, and quickly too. So now it was time to tackle the very last stage of all. At the top of a rock face at the end of the master cave, high above the sump, is a small hole.
that looks like the only way out. It is, but it has to be climbed up to. The climbing in caves is more of a means to an end, uh, with no emphasis on technique at all. And the prime factor is to get up or down as quickly as possible, in the easiest possible way. Possibly because of this lack of emphasis on climbing technique, mountaineers tend to look down on caving as a second-class sport. But there's as much skill in overcoming obstacles in these conditions as there is in climbing many a mountain. Even if cave climbing isn't a matter of expert technique, and even if the distances to climb aren't great, ladders help to conserve your rapidly dwindling energy. So, a ladder is called into play. Hauled up on a rope and suitably belayed to a safe rock projection at the top, it's then dropped down for the rest of the team to follow. Not all of them necessarily too happy about it. Dave Cobley recalls an alarming moment. There are occasions when ladders do break, and this is due mainly to rusting. Um, there was one occasion when one broke. John Russell was climbing the ladder in Lost Johns, and the belay just above the ladder um, rubbed through on a sharp projection of rock, and he fell about 20 feet. And uh, fortunately, I held him, and he was all right. The roof tunnel is the final obstacle. It isn't the hardest of the journey, but it has its hazards. Its hazards are just as uncomfortable as any encountered in the past four hours. There are ice-cold standing pools, and the roof dips suddenly, leaving only very restricted airspace above the surface of the water. traffic that's gone along the cave has sort of worn out a trough in the sand or silt at the floor. This means that a lot of the water levels have been lowered and uh, there was a time when the airspace itself was quite minimal and in fact you can see the calcite line on the wall as to the true height of the water at that time. Though the roof tunnel is 400 feet below the entrance, it's really very near the valley bottom. The first explorers of this roof tunnel suddenly saw signs of earthworms hereabouts, so they started to dig and very soon had broken through. It's taken our five cavers five hours to reach this spot. Five hours of missing the sunshine, the sight of the hills, the sound of the birds and the smell of the sweet fresh air before they reach the old oil drum casing that lets them pop up unexpectedly in the middle of a field for all the world like something from a goon film. Why? Well, it's got something to do with the satisfaction you get from conquering primitive fears, like fear of the darkness of water, of claustrophobia, and of pitting yourself against obstacle after obstacle and overcoming them. And it's got a lot to do with finding your real self. So on reflection, it might not be a bad way to spend a Sunday after all.